Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. Uh, the first thing that I would like to do is actually to thank you all uh, for being here and thank Microsoft for making this possible. Every chance to come to India is a treat, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and honored. Thank you. Um, and now, to see if you are going to be thankful uh, for me being here, we'll have to see at the end of these four lectures. But uh, uh, what I would like to do is actually to talk about uh, some work that uh, uh, we and other researchers have been pushing uh, in trying to understand what is the right way to model distributed systems that um, are even more mad than the distributed system that you have seen so far. Okay? Typically, there, there was no assumption in the discussion that you have heard so far about one aspect that actually defines um, what is potentially a reasonable uh, way to model distributed system, namely whether the nodes that belong to the system are all part of the same administrative domain or span uh, multiple administrative domains. Okay? That's what MAD stands for. Uh, although you probably, after you have heard all these lectures, you may think that MAD distributed system refers to something else. Uh, and uh, as, as I hope to convince you, there is a slightly different way of thinking about things that becomes important when you factor in the fact that these nodes may belong to different administrative domains. And since you have, uh, I cannot promise that it's going to be like this uh, for uh, all the lectures, but since you have had your uh, share of theorems, uh, for at least for you know, the next five minutes, I would like uh, to start with something different. Okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys are um, video game players. Anybody has played Diablo? I never, you have played Diablo. Okay, there you go. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> Marcus. So, so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, apparently we are, I, I don't play, I have to confess, but we are apparently at Diablo 3, which was eagerly awaited and apparently came out uh, mid-May, so just a few days ago. And uh, the weekend of April 20th, uh, the uh, maker of Diablo, a company called Blizzard, actually made the beta version available for download. Okay? And uh, it's one of those things that you say, well, it's a good idea. Let's make the beta version available for download. There are going to be maybe some buzz that is going to be created. And then before you know it, two million, uh, over two million people try to download this. And uh, it turns out that downloading uh, this file, I mean, the file that you have to download is in excess of four gigabytes. So if you are a blizzard, you say, on the one hand, you say, yay, two million people want to use uh, my, my, my game. On the other hand, now you have the problem to actually give these people what they want, or otherwise it's going to, I don't know, backfire. People are going to be really upset at you. So the problem that you have, in a way, is you're a blizzard, and you have you know, your, your little happy server, and uh, you have some content that you would like to give away. And the idea is um, uh, what you're going to do. There are going to be a bunch of clients, and the server is going to send uh, whatever content needs to send to the clients. Of course, the problem that uh, Blizzard had is that the situation was more like this, right? Where a, a, a lot of clients that wanted to download. So, of course, uh, something as naive as this will not work. So, what can they do? What can, what can Blizzard do? loud and uh, bold. What can they do? Well, they can buy more servers, right? They can buy more servers. And it's clear you don't work for Blizzard because then you don't want to pay for those servers. So you could buy more servers, but what is the problem in buying more servers? Suppose you're Blizzard and you say, well, let's just go and buy more servers. Sorry? In what sense is over-provisioning? I mean, essentially, just the surge of downloads will last for very Ah, right? There is going to be a short period of time during which everybody wants to download, and then that is going to die down. But whatever you have bought, you have bought. Huh? So that, you know, you could, you could go, you know, this way 
uh, but 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 that has you know some some downsides. What else could you do? The cloud, right? The cloud. Uh, you could go to the cloud, and actually that's a much uh, more um, uh, potentially economically attractive uh, approach. But you know, things when you start having millions of clients and whatever you're downloading is is really large, things have a way to uh, pile up. Uh, even even if you are using something more economically sound, potentially as a cloud solution. So. Uh, here is what the Blizzard guy decided to do. So it turns out that uh, you look at this uh, fancy you know, thing that tells you here is the game. Huh? And then if you, if you download the game, and if you search deep enough in the menus, you, know, you go through a bunch of menus, you're going to see that under preferences, there is a preferences like this that says uh, enable peer-to-peer -peer transfer. So the way in which actually uh, Blizzard tried to reduce its own cost was actually to make some of the guys that were downloading the data work for it somehow. Okay? They were creating a peer-to-peer -peer network in which, uh, after all, everybody was interested in exactly the same uh, data. Right? They wanted to download exactly the same time. So in order to uh, distribute the data, they figured that um, one way to do so was actually to have the client collaborate with each other, potentially unknowingly. Uh, if you go yesterday night, I was checking on the web what was the reaction of people at the fact that they were asked to actually spend all of this bandwidth. And a lot of people were really very unhappy. They, were, they figured this out. They eliminated it. They figured out that their, actually their ISP was punishing them for starting to do peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange. And so they were actually slower doing things peer-to-peer -peer than they were, it turns out, by doing them uh, downloaded from, uh, from uh, the original server. But, uh, you know, but in principle, this seems like a, a really nice idea, right? So, so how would we uh, make it happen if we were Blizzard? And we wanted to actually enable this peer-to-peer -peer exchange between the different parties. Well, uh, uh, if, that's, if the goal is indeed, as Peter would have told us, to, you know, to have each other, uh, to, to have the different nodes collaborate with each other, what I could do is to take the content huh, and actually divide it in, uh, in a bunch of chunks. Okay? And then what I could do is actually to seed different nodes with different pieces of content and then have them exchange things with each other. So, uh, you know, I could, I could put uh, different content in different nodes and then uh, through the magic of peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, they're going to exchange stuff with each other and um, they're all going to get the content and, uh, you know, and uh, everybody is going to be happy ever after. Okay? That's the idea. So, what is potentially an issue uh, with this setting? Okay? From a, the perspective of actually uh, having this being a dependable way of uh, distributing content. Well, if, uh, uh, if I look at a peer-to-peer uh, -peer setting here, let's actually focus simply on uh, uh, these two nodes. Huh? And it turns out that the, the node to uh, your left has uh, the portion one, the first portion of the content, and the node to your right has the second portion of the content. What should they be doing? Exchange, exchange right? They should exchange. So uh, 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 the first node uh, then is, is a nice guy and is going to uh, send its, uh, its data to node two. And, and then it's going to say, hey, uh, can I get, can I get my, my piece back? And uh, you know, what could happen is <laughs> huh? node 2 actually may not be there when it is time for node 2 to reciprocate. Okay? So, um, so you all smiled uh, because of, perhaps because just of the, of the you know, uh, uh, little cartoonish thing. But if you think about it, why would that be the case? Why you didn't, when, why did you smile instead of saying, oh, come on, that will never happen? 
uh, what made it uh, conceivable that node 1 may find itself in this situation? Why would node 2 disappear? Any reason why node 2 may disappear? Sorry? Saving its own bandwidth? Any other? Sorry? Failure. Right? So the first thing, let's, why, why do you guys have to think badly of node 2? Maybe, maybe node 2 is just a nice guy like uh, node 1. It's just that he suffered a failure. Right? Uh, so, uh, um, and, you know, if we ask ourselves, you know, what, why, why node 2 didn't, didn't send content, uh, there is a chance that it may not uh, uh, be able to do that because of some kind of fault. And as we saw, faults come in, uh, you know, in all shapes or form. And there is this notion of Byzantine that is capturing all shapes or form. Huh? But in reality, one thing that is very important that I would like you uh, to have clear is that there is, a, there is a difference between thinking of Byzantine. I mean, lots of people think of Byzantine as equivalent to malicious. That's incorrect. Byzantine is arbitrary. And arbitrary may be caused by a bug, by a misconfiguration, by, by you know, fairly, um, you know, things that don't require somebody to start uh, smiling diabolically when, uh, you know, whenever you get in to speak. Um, they, there needs to be no evil uh, intent. And still, failure may end up being arbitrary. So, that's one possibility. And in fact, it's a possibility that given that we are dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer environment in which um, the, the manager of that particular computational node is going to be you know, your little cousin, uh, the chances that uh, the device may not have been well maintained, the chance that um, uh, it may not have, if there is a crash, it may not have been backed up, the chance that uh, uh, they may not, has, may not have been patched appropriately, are potentially higher than they would have been with a professionally maintained machine, right? So this is certainly a possibility. Uh, but then there is another possibility, the one that you guys immediately thought about. Um, and uh, let me call that possibility uh, selfishness. Huh? A node may actually decide to deviate from what the protocol assigned to it as its correct behavior simply because <laughs> it's not in its interest to do so, right? Um, and, um, and actually, from uh, you know, what, what we are seeing here is just an instance of what makes these mad systems that I was describing to you uh, at the very beginning of this conversation, this mad system especially interesting and challenging from the perspective of actually being able to guarantee provable properties about them once they are deployed. Because in, in MAD systems, um, in addition to um, all the challenges, and by now you should be convinced that these challenges are mighty, uh, that are involved in simply handling nodes failing, huh? in addition to that, there is also the challenge that um, nodes may deviate from their specification, not because they are faulty, but because they are trying to maximize their utility. And if you think that this happens only in peer-to-peer -peer system, uh, although the conversation today is going to be focused mo today and next time is going to be focused mostly on examples that have that flavor, uh, that uh, I think you would be mistaken. If you think about, um, you know, even if you think about cloud environments, uh, it is the case that there, they are a very different administrative domain than you, the client. And you really have no idea how they are managing things inside. Right? For you, it's a black box. And if they can get away with, um, you know, with providing something um, that may not be exactly what you wanted and you are, without you being able to notice, uh, I mean, maybe Microsoft wouldn't do it. Maybe Google wouldn't do it, perhaps, because they are, you know, they, they, they are uh, you know, just uh, good guys and, uh, and uh, they are afraid that their brand would be tainted. But, you know. Uh, so, um, okay. So that's that's the challenge that we that I would like to discuss with you. Uh, what I would like to discuss with you is what is the right way to think about these math systems. Um, what is the right way to model math systems? Uh, and then once we have a model, um, is it possible? I mean, we could have a model and we could write a bunch of theory papers and. Uh, but can we actually build systems 
in this model. And suppose we can build them. Are they going to be systems that anybody is going to be interested in running? Or are they going to have performance that is going to make them you know, interesting as a, you know, as a specimen in a zoo, uh, but not otherwise of value? Okay. So uh, the first thing that I'd like to discuss is what is the right way, or the right way, or what is a, a, a good way, or a, a um, credible, or a whatever, plausible way to actually model um, math systems. Hmm? So we've seen a bunch of models throughout last week and this week. Uh, any model that comes to mind that would be able to model math systems in terms of the failure behavior that, you know, in terms of the deviations from the correct specification that nodes uh, um, display. Hmm? Yeah, the, Byz the, 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 the Byzantine model, um, I hope you all believe that the Byzantine model would work just fine. Why would it work f just fine since you proposed it? It captures everything that can go wrong. It makes no assumption about how nodes that deviate deviate. So in particular, it's going to be useful, it's going to be perfectly adequate to model deviations that are driven by selfish uh, motives as opposed to driven by whatever else. Right? Of course, it's going to have the um, it's going to, to, to have the, 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 the generality to be able to model. Um, the, uh, one of the things that though we have learned this week and last when we talked about uh, Byzantine fault is that, as even we were seeing today, a lot of interesting things cannot be solved if the number of Byzantine faults exceeds a threshold. And you guys were already questioning the speakers how do you pick that threshold, right? Uh, how do you come up with that threshold? And an answer, which is a very, you know, it's the answer that I would have given, is one, it is difficult. Two, one way in which you could do it is by perhaps, uh, certainly if you're looking at crash failures, perhaps you could start thinking about measuring mid mean time to failure, mean time to recover, blah, 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 blah. And on the basis of that, try to um, put some solid ground to your uh, guessing game. Um, for Byzantine faults, uh, Miguel was telling us that uh, one has to be careful for Byzantine faults because one has to be careful also about toler um, correlated failures, right? If there is, if there is a fault in uh, you know, some, some kind of vulnerability in one node that actually ends up being replicated in a bunch of other nodes, um, you are not going to have, you know, replication is not going to provide any more resilience to this kind of attack. But Let's give for a moment, uh, you know, let's make it, uh, let's embrace for a moment uh, the assumption that um, we have to make, if we are dealing with uh, Byzantine nodes, that at most T or F of them are faulty. As you know, for a bunch of interesting things, um, we need F to be less than a third, or otherwise we are in trouble. Now, if you have issues about setting those thresholds just for faults, just a, a quick look at uh, your fellow human beings around should suggest that putting some that, you know, coming up with any kind of bound on the number of nodes, namely an administrator of such nodes, that will um, try to be selfish uh, would be foolish, right? Especially if all you have to do to be selfish is maybe download from somewhere a different client for an application that instead of doing what the original client was doing, which was maybe consuming some resources and providing in exchange some resources back, you download a different client that all it does is actually consume some resources and then, you know, try to get away with murder. Okay? So the, uh, my uh, contention to you is that although the Byzantine model has the expressive power of capturing, to capture what we, what we want to capture, in some sense, it doesn't scale uh, to the problem that we are trying to face. Because, again, it relies for some of its guarantees on certain bounds existing. And those bounds are very hard to enforce if we decide to model every rational node as Byzantine. 
OK? So, so Byzantine models, uh, you know, the Byzantine model, it's uh, general enough, but it has this sort of scalability, uh, potential scalability issue. So the other thing that we could do is to do what? You know, I start talking about selfishness, about what is the, you know, the, 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 the mathematical tools that come to mind. Game theory, right? Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can think about uh, relying on uh, uh, the work that, you know, from John Nash on, uh, people have uh, uh, developed in the context of game theory. And the idea there is that you're going to model um, all nodes in the system as rational, right? And um, of course, these rational nodes is another, is a synonym, rational, I use it as a synonym for selfish, uh, which it's, uh, I don't want to explore the philosophical implications of that. But um, uh, so the rational nodes can deviate selfishly from their specification. Uh, and then what you're trying to look for is some sort of uh, notion that is going to provide some equilibrium, right? So for instance, there is the famous Nash equilibrium that you may have heard about. And we are going to be talking about that, in which you're basically assuming that when nodes are in a Nash equilibrium, uh, if all nodes follow the strategy that is specified by the equilibrium, no single participant will have an incentive to deviate from its assigned strategy. So, sounds great. Um, the, the problem with this approach is that typically in, in that world, what you are assuming is that every node behaves rationally. That's the basis on which you are doing all of your construction. But in the world in which we are, there may be uh, some node that may appear to us as not behaving rationally. For instance, think about buggy nodes, right? Whatever behavior they're going to express, this arbitrary behavior, is not driven by, you know, notion of maximizing somebody's utility. It's just driven by a bug. Um, you could have, of course, there may also be nodes that are truly malicious and they are entering the system in order to, um, you know, try to disrupt the system. Maybe there is some rationality. They have their own rationality behind all of this. But uh, their, whatever the rationale is, may be blind, you know, may be invisible to us, maybe, uh, you know, we, we cannot uh, model. And so those nodes appear really to us as Byzantine nodes. So assuming that you can simply model a system like the one that we have discussed before as one in which every node will behave rationally uh, seems very fragile. Uh, and in fact, what happens is that uh, in uh, many of these constructions, if nodes can deviate from, you know, can deviate from the, um, uh, from the equilibrium for, you know, for reason, reasons other than their self-interest, then actually the whole construction uh, crumbles. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a very brittle uh, notion to simply use uh, the, uh, you know, simply use a rational uh, model to, um, uh, to try to deal with these mad systems. So if we now take a step back, then the situation in which we are is one in which we are trying to deal with a system in which some nodes may deviate from the specification because they're broken. And potentially, every other node may deviate as well because they're selfish. So I may find myself in a system in which potentially no node would be following the spec. And the task that we have ahead for us is to uh, try to build services with provable properties in an environment in which a priori I have no guarantee that anybody would be, you know, uh, signing up on the dotted line to follow the property. Okay? So, so before we actually get to how we are, I mean, this is something that we are working on. It's not by, if you expect that at the end of this conversation, you'll have all the answers and you're going to be saying, oh, well, yeah, that, that was fun. Um, no, it's not going to be like this. And actually, maybe you, you know, you, you'll find this interesting and you will want to, um, to think about this. And maybe those of you who can may want to think about this at UT Austin. So 
you know, plug uh, uh, with, with no, no, no shame. Um, so let me tell you who is uh, to blame for everything you're going to see. Okay? So there is, uh, the, 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 the people that really, of course, as, as you already know, probably, uh, the people that really do the work are the students. And uh, uh, Alan is now deciding, he's finishing a postdoc with Peter, as it happens at uh, MPI, and one of the places that we could, we could go is actually to become a faculty at MPI itself. He has, a, he has an offer there. Harry broke my heart and went to Facebook. Uh, um, uh, and uh, you know, so those of you at MSR may know JP. Uh, JP was at Cambridge and now is at MSR uh, Silicon Valley. And then um, uh, Ed, is actually still a student, so he's the only guy in this picture who's actually doing the work right now. Uh, and um, uh, we'll talk about some of the results. Some, actually, I'm, I'm going to talk, if, uh, if uh, all goes well, I'm going to talk about some results that we haven't even published yet. So you're, I'm going to get some feedback from you guys. Uh, and then um, this, is, uh, this has been joint work uh, with Mike Dalin, that is also a speaker here, and he's going to talk about as Monty Python would say, something completely different uh, next, uh, you know, tomorrow, I think, is going to start. Okay, let's go back to our research agenda. So here is what I suggest that we do, okay? The first thing that I want, and, and so the first thing that I want to do is to come up with a model that is going to allow us to actually talk knowing what we are talking about uh, when we try to reason about uh, these systems. Without a model, we are lost, right? We are just blabbering. We need that. And then, as I was saying, is we need to find some way to convince ourselves that actually the model that we have come up with is somewhat usable and that the um, uh, systems that we uh, somehow are able to build are actually um, practical. Uh, they have performance that makes them, uh, to some degree, attractive. So the model that I'm going to uh, be uh, so the model that we ended up uh, uh, proposing is a model that uh, we call uh, BAR. Uh, and that has nothing to do with what you do in the evening uh, after a long day of work. Uh, it's, uh, it's come from an acronym that considers the, three, the first letter of the three classes of nodes that we explicitly model in our system. We say that the system is uh, uh, comprised of three classes of nodes, Byzantine nodes. Again, Byzantine nodes are nodes that whose, they may be rational for all I know, but I don't know how to model their rationality. I model them as Byzantine, and they can do anything. Okay? Then I have rational node, the good old selfish node that they're going to deviate if and only if it is in their interest. And then I have this other class of nodes that are the good guys. The guys that, I mean, not everybody is like they're constantly saying how I'm going to maximize my utility. These are uh, the nodes that actually normally, you know, that, that are not going to deviate. Um, uh, we used to call, in the first version, you know, when we came up with bar, we used to call these altruistic nodes because they were the nice guys. Then somebody pointed out that um, to us, actually Joe Halpern pointed out to us, that uh, Joe Halpern is a professor at Cornell, uh, pointed out to us that the notion of altruistic may actually suggest that these nodes not just follow the protocol, but go out of their way to actually, you know, they, they meet you in the street and say, would you like my rupees? <laughs> Please take my rupees. Uh, and that's certainly not what we uh, had in mind. Uh, he suggested that we call, uh, call them obedient. But, you know, we, it's already hard to get to people to accept your model if you start by saying we have a new exciting area and the model behind it is the Bohr model, <laughs> <laughs> somehow it didn't, it didn't work very well. So we decided to actually keep it bar and instead of, of obedient, we went on the synonym and we found acquiescent and we said, yeah, it's going to be <laughs> acquiescent. But think of them as uh, obedient, okay? Okay, so this is the model that we are going to be, uh, we are going to be exploring. But the first thing that I would like to do is actually try to uh, uh, convince you that, in fact, um, behind the you know, show and tell that I've done, there is actually some substance. You know, it's true that there are these, I mean, of, I hope you believe that selfishness may appear in these systems. 
What is not obvious is that we need a specific different solution from the solutions that Marcos and others have already told us, right? Maybe we are just lucky and the Byzantine model takes care of everything, huh? except potentially for this bound that we were discussing. Uh, the Byzantine model already takes care of everything. So the first thing that I would like to do is actually give you a small example to try to give you, to give some credence to the fact that um, when we are introducing a selfish behavior, we are working in a slightly different environment than uh, before. Yes? Right, they're mutually exclusive. Uh, so if I know this Byzantine, it's Byzantine. I'm not mutually exclusive because I guess uh, for our count, they are mutually exclusive. When, when, when we count faults, they're mutually exclusive. Of course, whoever is rational uh, is also Byzantine because any failure is a Byzantine failure because Byzantine potentially includes everything. But we are considering uh, if they are rational, we say that they do that and don't do everything else. When they, they are Byzantine, they can do anything. Okay? Yes? Malicious nodes are Byzantine. Malicious nodes can deviate in any way. We, in fact, do uh, model malicious nodes. And potentially, again, the, the most natural way to imagine malicious, to imagine uh, uh, the role for Byzantine node is to imagine them as malicious, perhaps. But again, as I was pointing out, uh, it's, you don't have to be thinking about conspiracy theories to have to worry about Byzantine nodes. Just false may be a reason for Byzantine nodes. Just nodes who's rational, that may be rational, but just, you just don't know what, they, what is in there. You, know, you don't know their utility function. Uh, those we're gonna model as Byzantine. Um, okay? Okay, so, um, so um, a, to try to convince you that uh, there may be something to this, I'm going to talk about uh, something, I mean, to refresh you with something that, uh, uh, Marcus just finished talking about. This is terminating reliable broadcast, that uh, problem that was this variation over consensus in which instead of having everybody proposing, there is a distinguished proposer, so to speak, the sender. And uh, the properties that we are going to be, um, uh, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you've you just seen it, okay? So the, 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 the goal here is that if a correct process delivers a message, all correct processes should deliver the message. And if the sender is correct, the message that is being delivered should be the message from the sender. Otherwise, if the sender is faulty, you have the freedom, as if you are correct, you have the freedom to deliver some token that here is called SF for sender faulty. But better be the case that everybody who's correct does the same thing. So if some correct delivers sender faulty, everybody ought to deliver sender faulty. Everybody correct ought to deliver sender faulty. Okay? Yes. Ah, we don't know. Of course we don't know. But uh, when we are going to make assumptions, we will make assumptions that the number of Byzantine nodes does not exceed, say, one-third. Because we know that anyway we can't do anything if it exceeds one-third. But we are not going to make any assumption about the number of rational nodes. The rational nodes may be n minus one-third. <laughs> okay, less than one-third, but whatever. N, n minus b. Okay, so one thing that uh, I may ask is, uh, does it, is it the case that uh, the BFT protocols that we know um, solve TRB when processes are, you know, are bar instead of simply Byzantine? And actually, I'm going to uh, slightly st uh, do solve a, a slightly different problem in which I'm going to use a model in which um, nodes are allowed to deviate arbitrarily. But I'm going to use a stronger assumption about the way in which they interact with each other. I'm going to use a model that I call, that is called, not I call, that uh, Lamport actually introduced. It's called arbitrary failure with message authentication. And here, message authentication doesn't simply mean that if I uh, send a message to you, then you know that it's coming from me. But it means that actually uh, you would be able to convince somebody else that the message came from me. So we are using something akin to signature, okay? When, when we send messages. In fact, you have seen this discussion about hierarchies of failure model. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is a way to look at the hierarchy of failure model. There are you know, some you know, strong failure model at the top, crash, fail, stop, and then you have omissions. 
And then this looks a little bit, how many of you are familiar with, um, uh, there, is, there is a poem in Italian literature. It's called um, The Divine Comedy. I don't know if you have ever heard of uh, this poet called Dante. Everybody says that Dante is it's number two after Shakespeare. So if you think that Shakespeare is pretty cool, Dante is close by. Of course, nobody that writes such thing has ever read the Mahabharata, or so uh, that's acknowledged. But uh, so it turns out that there is this poet that goes down in hell, and hell is shaped something like this. And at the very bottom of hell, there is Lucifer, who is you know the devil, the number one certified devil. And here, in a way, you know, it's sort of shaped like this. Here you can sin, but this sort of nice sin. I mean, the most that you can do is to crash. Here, you get really nasty, arbitrarily nasty. Arbitrary failure with master authentication says that you can sin arbitrarily, but somehow you have to take responsibility for what you're doing because when you are sending messages, you can send different messages, but you're going to sign them with uh, unforgeable signature. Of course, if we are a bunch of bad guys, we can forge each other's signature, but good guys will not be able to forge the signatures of bad guys. Okay? And so, uh, just to another thing that I thought it would be useful is actually there was some discussion now that Marcus has spoken uh, probably there is no need to for this but hey um, the way I think of, uh, of uh, um, you know failure there are these Byzantine failure that capture everything and then there are really there are this crash and uh, omission failure and together they are truly omission failure crash is an omission failure as well in other words these are failure in which the faulty node does not do something that is supposed to do. Huh? And then you go, when you come down here, um, there are what sometimes are called commission failure, in which nodes do what they are not supposed to do, as opposed to simply not doing what they are supposed to do. And if you consider the combination of all, you get this Byzantine that captures everything. Okay? So anyway, uh, when I was talking about, we are, we are here, okay? Not quite in the pit of hell, but close. And um, so we sign this message with unforgeable signatures, and process it can send potentially conflicting messages to uh, different receivers. And um, let me show you a classic protocol by Lamport, a very simple protocol that is very similar to the protocols that you've already seen, that actually solves this problem. The idea is Again, that uh, nodes are going to, whenever they send a message, they are going to sign what they send. And um, uh, remember, there is this distinguished sender, and the problem is clear, right? Good. So the whole the, the, the entire uh, protocol relies on the notion that um, in order for a correct process to accept a message, to just look at a message in a particular round, this is going to be, once again, a protocol we are in a synchronous environment and it's going to be once again a protocol that is going to run in f plus one or t plus one whatever round okay just like the good old crash um, uh, scheme so there is some notion of well-formedness on the messages that are being uh, received by nodes so in the first round if i'm the sender i'm going to take the message and i'm going to sign it okay and then send it in successive rounds what uh, what correct nodes are supposed to do is actually um, take the message that they have received in the previous round, append their own signature to the message. Right? And you can imagine that there's sort of this envelope that one inside the other and outside they are signed. Okay? And send it forward. Okay? That's, that's the scheme. And um, a, pro a correct process in round R is going to... Um, actually be happy, consider a message valid, and then it's going to look at it. Otherwise, that's going to drop it on the ground if it's not valid. But to, for it to be valid, it ought to be signed by R processes. These processes should all be distinct. Huh? One uh, should be uh, um, the sender, and um, um, the last one should be the one from which we have immediately received. And there is, we assume, that a, a process on receipt of this message, if somebody has tried to tamper with the message that the sender originally sent and modify it somehow, just by inspection, I'm going to be able to, to, to notice that that happened, and I'm going to throw it on the ground. So that means that uh, if the sender is correct, 
Byzantine participants, other than the sender, cannot distribute different messages in, uh, in the system because if they try to do that, I, the, the correct nodes that were re to receive these um, massaged messages would be able to notice that they have been tampered with. Okay? Now, if, uh, if uh, that's the scheme, then the, uh, then the uh, protocol um, uh, is, is fairly simple. Uh, you know, you discard uh, the messages that are not valid. If you receive a valid message, what you're going is to extract the content of the message and put it in a bag that you're going to look at at the end of F plus one round. So this bag is going to collect all the valid, all the distinct valid messages that you have seen, okay? And you're going to play this game that I was saying before. When you receive something that is valid, you're going to uh, send it again in, uh, in the following round. And the idea is that when you get um, to round F plus one, you're going to look at your bag. If the bag contains exactly one message, then you're going to deliver that message. In every other case, you're going to deliver sender fault. Okay? That's, that's the protocol. And if you look, so that's, it's actually a very simple protocol. Here, here it is. Okay, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, see, the sender starts, there are these two sets, the sets of extracted stuff and the st set of messages that you're going to relay in the next round. Initially, the sender it's, you know, starts with having extracted its own message and the relay, whatever is going to relay is the message itself. And then it's going to go on for F plus one round. Uh, when you receive something, um, uh, when you receive something, uh, you are going to uh, add it to uh, the set. So if it is valid, you are going to add it to the set of messages that you are going to relay, and you are going to extract it and put it in this bag, this set that contains everything you have to extract. It. And also, you are going to, um, where is it? Um, Right, and, and you're going to um, also send uh, whatever you had put in the relay uh, set in the previous round, okay? We are using this uh, round model in which in every round you uh, send messages and then uh, you, you, know, you receive and modify your, your state. At the end of round F plus one, just what I was saying before. Everybody is with me? Any question about this? Yes. Do you, what is not very clear? Oh, when, how do we arrive in the situation in which we could have received more than one message? Sorry? How could that happen, that we receive distinct messages? Uh, is that if we are delivered by malicious guys? So if I'm a good guy, I'm going to only accept valid messages. And for a message to be valid, it has to be signed by the sender, right? And if somebody tries to tamper that message, I will be able to notice. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to even look at it. So how can I possibly find myself with multiple messages in my bag at the end? Yes. There is, so in this, uh, in this, uh, this problem, we are assuming that there is a single sender and there is one message that I'm trying to get through. So it's a single shot, okay? It's not repeated. So it may be the case that everybody crashes and the, you know, the, the, the message is somehow lost, and at the end of F plus one round, the surviving correct process is all they can do. They have their bag is empty. All they can do is to do sender faulty. But the question was, how can you get more than one? Sorry. Yes, if the sender is is Byzantine, the sender can actually sign distinct messages, and they are certainly going to look legit, right? Because when I, in the first round I'm going to receive them, I'm going to say, oh, it's signed by the sender. I'm going to forward it. I'm going to extract it, put it in my bag, I'm going to forward it. Later, 
um, if, uh, if I find myself with, uh, uh, you know, multiple, intuitively, if I find myself with uh, multiple messages, distinct messages in my bag, it must be because the sender actually sent distinct messages, which meant, means that the sender was faulty, which means that it's okay to um, uh, deliver sender fault. That's the intuition, okay? And actually, I have a proof, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the proof. I know you're sad, but uh, we are going to give me, give me a moment to skip over uh, the proof. And let me give you instead, so this is Lamport's algorithm. And everybody sends a message to everybody else. Uh, there is uh, an order n squared uh, messages that are being exchanged. And Dolev and Strong came about shortly after and said, hey, wait a second. There is really no point in doing this forwarding. The moment I see, you know, doing this forwarding just blindly. The moment I see that my bag contains two messages, I already know that the sender is faulty. I don't need to start keep forwarding a third message, a fourth message that are all distinct, right? The moment I notice that um, 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 two messages, then, uh, uh, then the game is over. And it turns out that uh, if I, otherwise the protocol is the same, okay? And it turns out that if I use this simple optimization, I can actually reduce the message complexity. And what I'm going to uh, uh, try to argue is that um, if I look at Dolan and Strong uh, improvement, it turns out that that's uh, in an environment in which nodes are bar, uh, that would not be a satisfactory solution. Okay? And um, in order to be able to even begin to argue that way, uh, since I'm going to talk about selfishness and uh, uh, I need to define for you what is, the, uh, what is that node's value, what is that they consider cost and benefit, what is their utility, in other words, so that I can determine if nodes are going to stick with the program or they're going to deviate, okay? And um, so um, here is what I'm going to do. And... Uh, I'm going to say that nodes incur a cost when they are sending a message. And I'm going to say that the cost that they incur is going to be proportional to the number or the length of the message. Okay? Basically, I'm measuring bandwidth. Okay? And in terms of benefit, I'm going to assume, remember that there are these properties, validity, agreement, uh, integrity, termination. I'm going to assume that if you are... Uh, you know, you could make different choices. I'm going to assume that if you are the sender, you are interested, you know, you get benefit when these properties are satisfied. Because after all, as the sender, you want your data. You, you're trying to make sure that everybody is going to deliver your data. If you are somebody other than the sender, maybe you're not interested in validity. So you're not necessarily interested in the fact that you get what the sender wants to send you. But certainly you're interested in agreement. You don't want to make sure that certainly. That's the assumption that you're making, that you're interested in agreement, that you want to make sure that still, no matter what, all correct processes are going to do the same thing, okay? Uh, and in the other, and in termination and in integrity as well, okay? Or perhaps there is some linear combination of these two. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter as it turns out. But that's, in general, what I'm saying. I'm saying that the benefit comes from actually satisfying the spec, and the cost comes from communicating. Okay? Yes? Uh, maybe it wants. So maybe it's some linear combination. Maybe it wants. Um, you know, there is a, you could conceive that as somebody that is not the sender, I really don't care about what you want to tell me, perhaps. But I at least want to make sure that all of us who are correct are going, at the end of this TRB, are still going to have delivered exactly the same sequence of messages, say. Okay? You could conceive that, uh, or you could imagine that it's really important for me to actually get the message of the sender, in which case, that's fine. Okay, so if I look then as a way 
to try to uh, model TRB as a game. Hmm? Um, um, so I'm going to define for each process a strategy uh, that I'm going to denote the strategy of uh, process I I'm going to denote to uh, lowercase sigma I that is taken from some set of all possible strategy. And there is this notion of a strategy profile that is sort of a vector of strategy that actually associates a strategy to each of the processes. Okay? Good. So, um, so for instance, uh, here I have a bunch of nodes, and uh, this node has strategy sigma 1, this node strategy sigma 2, strategy sigma 3. Okay? And uh, the utility is going to be benefit minus cost, right? and that's how I'm going to denote. Um, okay. So, and that's, um, um, it's time now to, to, to discuss the problem is, uh, time to, um, get back to this notion of Nash equilibrium that I was, on which I was waving my hands, uh, before, right? This notion of Nash equilibrium that it's, is a, a strategy profile from which individual nodes have no interest in deviating. So if I have this, uh, you can imagine that. I start from a situation in which there is some strategy profile that I'm going to call the Nash strategy profile. And this is whatever the Nash strategy profile requires for node one. This is what it requires for node two. This is what it requires for node three. And if I have, if I am say node two, I'm going to consider the possibility of, uh, of deviating. Okay. And um, what I'm going to, what, what it has to be the case is that uh, the utility of actually staying in Nash is going to be at least as much as the utility of deviating for any possible deviation. Okay. Um, so if I, you know, if I, if I want to use some some Greek letters and some LaTeX, that's what I would do. And here, the notation that I'm doing here is I'm saying that the utility that I have, if everybody is using the same strategy profile, is at least as much as the utility in which everybody but I is using their strategy that they have chosen. And I happens to be use, using a different strategy row. Okay. All right. And it turns out that um, if I have a, a strategy profile, you know, a set of uh, uh, conditions that actually can uh, lead to an, an equilibrium, that is called a solution concept. So here, uh, our solution concept in this particular case is a Nash equilibrium. There may be different solution concept. Nash equilibrium is a compelling one. But we are going to see uh, today that there may be also other solution concepts that we may be interested in. So given this, um, yes. I'm, I'm assuming that there is some effort that is involved in switching. And all things being equal, you might as well stay with what has been given to you. So if I give you, you know, this protocol to run, there is some effort that is involved in actually deciding that you want to do something else. All things being equal, you're going to stay with it. You have no reason to deviate. Okay. So um, and, uh, here you have to imagine if I wanted to show that Say the dollar. The goal here would be then to show that the dollar strong protocol is an is an Nash equilibrium. And uh, here the strategy would be everybody is following the dollar strong protocol. And I what we are asking is is that is that an equilibrium? And I'm going to uh, consider as a potential deviation the following alternative. Okay? This is what I'm calling a lazy alternative. Um, so. Um, the lazy alternative follows dollar protocol, you know, uh, most of the times, but um, it doesn't follow it in the following sense: that while typically when uh, I'm asked in a in a um, uh, round, if I'm asked to um, forward a message, you know, appending my signature, I send it to everyone. Here, instead, in this lazy alternative, I'm going to send it only to f plus 1 minus k other nodes, distinct other nodes, where um, uh, k is uh, the number of nodes that I've already seen have signed a message. Okay? 
So I'm sending fewer messages. Okay. So uh, just to give you, suppose that the leader were lazy. Huh? If the leader was lazy, in the first, if in dollar strong, it would send to everyone. If I have f equal two and n equal five, um, he would actually send to um, right. He would actually send to three, right? F plus one minus k, k is zero at this point, and f plus one would be three, two plus one, right? Good. Um, and the idea here is that um, in the next round, so why can I get away with that? Because, you know, why can I hope to get away with that and still be able to achieve validity agreement and everything else? Because if I send it to f plus 1 minus k, I have the guarantee that I'm actually sending this message to at least one correct process, one acquiescent process. And that acquiescent process is going to say, hey, let's send a message to everybody. And that is going to take care of business. Um, so, uh, so, for instance, in, uh, you know, in the next round, in dollar strong, I would have something like this. Uh, oh, sorry. I would have something like this. And here, if I'm, you know, the lazy leader could still be guaranteed that all correct processes are going to get the message. And then all are going to uh, uh, be able to achieve agreement uh, and, you know, what is required. And to actually um, uh, to make that a little more uh, precise, um, again, what I would like to uh, show is that uh, dollar strong is not a Nash equilibrium. And the first thing that I have to do is to argue, which in part I've already done, that it is OK. It is rational, in fact. There is an advantage. The utility of a node that is lazy increases by being lazy in the sense that its cost is going to be less because it's going to send fewer messages. But under the assumption that everybody else follows dollar strong, if only one follows the lazy alternative, uh, validity, agreement, integrity uh, are still all going to hold for everyone. So I, you know, if I am the lazy guy, I'm going to think I hit the, you know, I won the lottery because I spend less, and yet I can prove that there is no damage that is done to the utility. So I can actually think that not only I can get away with something, but I'm really not hurting anybody. Because anyway, I'm going to be able to um, continue to guarantee the same safety and liveness properties of before. Um, and uh, the intuition, well, I'm not going to prove it for you, but the intuition is what we have seen before. Right? Um, when, I, when a process, uh, even if it is uh, um, uh, lazy and follows lambda. If it relays a message, it knows that it's going to be reaching at least one um, known Byzantine uh, process, which therefore would follow dollar strong and then send a message to everyone else. So the problem, of course, is that um, you know if you think that uh, if there is a long line, I know I know that Italian and Indians are you know very close. So I, I haven't seen people getting in line. Well, I have seen at uh, Mysore people trying to get in line for tickets. And uh, we think the same. Um, there is the assumption that I'm the only one that actually has thought that you can cut the line and you don't need to be in a nice ordered British line. Right? Uh, but guess what? It turns out that everybody is thinking like me. And then it becomes a, you know, a nonsensical conglomerate of people beating each other up in front of, uh, of the place that sells tickets. And the same is true when it, got, when it gets to um, uh, dollar strong. Um, uh, um, so of course, of course, so here there is a point that I was forgetting to make. Of course, this is not a Nash equilibrium given this theorem, because if I'm the lazy guy, I have an interest to deviate, right? I clearly have an interest to deviate. My cost is less. My benefit is the same. Um, Again, there is this, this thing in, that uh, is sometimes called the tragedy of the commons, in which one guy doing something is not going to hurt the, um, the, uh, the benefit. Um, but if everybody tries to do it, then things get out of control. And in fact, one can easily prove that if all processes say, you know, good idea being lazy, then in fact, 
um, validity agreement uh, stop holding. And in fact, um, um, you, um, you end up losing, okay? The, the safety and liveness properties are not guaranteed anymore. And again, um, uh, one can come up with, uh, you know, an argument for it. Suppose that I have the rational process, uh, you know, somebody that wants to use lambda is the leader, is only going to send it to, um, remember, f plus one minus k, initially, therefore, f plus one. And suppose he sends it to these, and these two happen to be Byzantine. Now suppose that Q is also says, oh, good idea. I'm also going to send it to F plus one minus K. Now, of course, F plus one minus K, since K is one, uh, now it, it sends it only to two. So it happens to pick the two that are Byzantine. And of course, the two that are Byzantine, say, decide to not um, send any more messages and what we find ourselves is that P and Q have received the message. They're known Byzantine, and uh, they would deliver that message. T also happens to be known Byzantine, but he has received them. nothing. Would look at the bag at the end of the execution, say, standard faulty. And agreement would be violated, okay? So I think that this is um, a good time for us. Is, is it a good time? Is a good, it's a good time for us to stop. And um, what I would, let me tell you what I would like to do this afternoon, just one second. Um, what I would like to do is to um, ask ourselves what is a reasonable solution concept, so some notion of equilibrium, that makes sense in a bar world, okay? So first we're going to discuss that, and then I'm going to try to move, and you will see that people disagree. We have our own view, other people have their view. Uh, I'm, of course, going to provide you a very biased account of uh, the two points of view, and you get to uh, decide. And then we're going to start talking about, can you build systems uh, in this setting? And I'm going to try to provide you some example of such systems, okay? But this is after 